Today is June 15th, 2011. And we're in Hugo, Oklahoma today interviewing Jim Royal. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for coming down. Well, let's learn a little bit more about you. Could you tell us uh, where you were born, where you grew up? I grew up in the, in the suburbs of Chicago in a town called Maywood, which is a western suburb of Chicago, very close to the city, in a, a kind of a working class neighborhood. And what year were you born? 1948. Okay. A, a, a baby boomer, one of the aged baby boomers. Well, well, tell me about your first circus memory when you were younger. Well, I remember going, um, there was a circus appeared in a, uh, a tented circus, appeared in a, one of the local parks that I used to go to. And I remember going into the, uh, going on the swings and someone in the trailer came out and I don't remember exactly what they said, but kind of like, hey kid, get out of here. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And at the time I thought, wait a minute, this is our park. What are you doing here? And that was kind of my initial memory of the, of the, of the first circus experience. Okay. Well, you know, as you're, you're getting older, uh, did you have any interactions with circus growing up? In a remote way, my grandmother's sister um, kind of ran away with the circus, so to speak. She fell in love with a, a circus performer, a man who was uh, named Chief Keys, Clarence Keys, and he was from Fort Towson, right near Hugo, and he worked primarily with Hugo Services, and he was a... Uh, mostly Choctaw Indian, and uh, was a Wild West performer, a sharpshooter, a knife thrower, and she became his human target in the knife throwing act. And I had never met her. I mean, they lived out here and toured all the time. And I didn't, uh, never met her, but I later corresponded with her when I got interested in the circus. And when you were getting interested with, with the circus, what were you hoping to, to do? Were you looking to become a performer? Uh, break into the business? Were you just uh, naturally curious about the family history? It, when I was in the, I guess the sixth grade, we, uh, or the seventh grade, I'm not sure which, I was a safety patrol boy. Um, years ago you had youngsters in school who wore a white belt and helped other children cross the street safely. And, uh, sorry, this cat here tickling me. <laughs> and um, they took us as a reward to the Medina Shrine Circus in Chicago. And it was in the, the loop, in, well, just outside of the loop in the city. And the Medina Temple was a beautiful, ornate old building, marvelous old place. And, and at that time, the circus was produced by Pollock Brothers, which had a real powerhouse of a show. And we were in, I think, the third row right there. And it was an amazing circus, real high quality show. And I was quite taken with it. And the building, too, inside, it was very, very interesting. And uh, it just really fascinated me. I think that's where it really got things started. And I think I'm fortunate in that I'm one of those people that early, very early in life, realized what I wanted to do in life. And that was it. You know, I'm set. For so many people uh, wander around trying to, to find themselves, as we used to say in the 60s, or uh, find something that they enjoy doing for a living. But I was lucky. Uh, yeah. And uh, not long after that, I'm in the local library browsing through the shelves, and uh, my eye was caught a book called The Circus Kings, which was by Henry Ringling North, whose uh, his, uh, father was married to the only Ringling sister, and uh, his uh, other was the only Ringling sister, and um, his uncles were the Ringling brothers, and, and he and his brother ran the circus for many years, and he wrote this book, fascinating book, and telling about their experiences, and that really hooked me, and I decided that was for me, and I always wanted to do the business side of it, the, the managing side of it. And did you have any early mentors uh, learning the business end? Yes, uh, I was very fortunate when I was in uh, a sophomore in high school, a friend of mine was kind of interested in the circus too. I got him interested in it. And he wrote to one of the circuses, Christiani Wallace Brothers, uh, not a Hugo show, they were out of Sarasota, Florida, and asked if they would be in the Chicago area. And they wrote him a letter and said, yes, we're going to be in the Chicago area, and can you get us a sponsor? That was all we needed to know. We were, we were set. So we raced about and, and uh, found a local organization that would be interested in sponsoring the circus. We called the circus up and they said, okay, we've got a, a, what we call a contracting agent. In those days, an agent who booked the circus with the local communities and named Jack LaPearl. We're going to send Jack LaPearl out. Jack lives in Wheat. Wheat is about know, 20 miles west of where I live. And Jack LaPearl, we were uh, 
excited because La Pearl was a famous circus name. There had been a La Pearl circus, and um, Jack's brother Harry was married in uh, in center ring. He was a clown in clown wardrobe at uh, the old Madison Square Garden in I don't know 1907 or something like that. It was a big big production. And so Jack came, and Jack Laferrell at that time, I'm guessing, was maybe 75, 76, sprite and dapper and debonair and charming and as uh, uh, fun, and interesting a guy as you could possibly meet. And um, he came out to talk to the sponsor with us, and then we would go visit him, and then I would go out into towns in northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, Indiana, booking the circus with him in the wintertime. He's just wonderful company and, and a wonderful mentor. And was that your first job? Yes, I was still in school, of course, mm -hmm. high school, but, but we would go out and book the circus together. Well, well, take me through, you know, your early career. What, what happened after high school? Uh, well, I always wanted to go every summer, and my parents said, I, are you nuts? No. <laughs> they said, you're too young, you shouldn't be doing that. So when I was 18, they said, okay, you can go. So I graduated uh, high school on a Thursday, and Saturday morning I was on a train to Nina, Wisconsin, um, and where I was joining the old Algae Kelly at Miller Brothers Circus to take a job as a ticket taker in the summer. And um, I did that. And I remember the first day I, I took the job, they had a tremendous sale. And I arrived just in time to kind of get up there in about 15 minutes before they opened doors to the circus. And then midway was just a huge sea of people all itching to get in there. And wow, it was a little bit intimidating. So I spent that summer with, with the circus, and then I went to the University of Illinois in Chicago to, uh, to get my doctorate. I lasted four months. And Chicago, and the, this was in the fall and in the wintertime, and it was, uh, it, was, it was a new campus. It was all modern and all concrete, and it had no soul to it. It's primarily a commuter campus. And the circus at that time, Kelly Miller, uh, for a few years, wintered in Ocean Springs, Mississippi on the Gulf Coast. And I'd be sitting in class like eight in the morning or something, having driven as a commuter and then you know, some traffic for 40 minutes. And thinking, ah, oh, they're down there at Ocean Springs. And, and here I am looking out the window, the wind whistling in Chicago. So after four months, I resigned my career as a university student and rejoined the circus. And this time, that was 1967. And I started that year working in the sideshow. Uh, I learned to eat fire, and I was a, an apprentice sword swallower. I was working on it, but never really became a full-fledged sword swallower. Did magic, punch, and judy, and did what we call a, a talker. Now, a lot of people refer to him as a barker, but in the circus, we always called that person a talker. What was it hard? Uh, you know, you, you think of fire eaters and sword swallowers. Is, is that a hard uh, performer? performance act to learn? The biggest problem for me is seriously was overcoming the fear of that first time of putting the fire in your mouth. Uh, there, are certain, there are no real tricks to it. You just have to be very cautious. You have to keep your mouth moist. You always have to exhale. You have to come at a certain angle, things like that mm -hmm. uh, for the basics of it, which I just kind of did the basics. But it is a dangerous thing. Um, we have a man with the show that's been doing it for many, many years, and he was trying a different fluid, and he, he got burned earlier this year. As so often is the case, many circus arts are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And who was uh, teaching you the finer points uh, of these performance acts? Well, performance I, arts. At that time, I, when I joined the circus down on Ocean Springs, there was some. I just finished. This is a side light. You can always cut these bits out. I had just finished reading W. C. Fields' His Follies and Fortunes by um, was it by Robert Louis Taylor. I think it was him that did a circus book later. But anyway, uh, there was Thomas Hart, who was the sideshow manager, and Thomas Hart was this uh, larger-than-life character, a bit like W.C. Field. He had kind of that sort of a voice. And, um, and, and he and a guy named Charlie Rourke were there. Charlie was just visiting for the first few weeks of the tour, and they taught me the sideshow things. So, so take me what happens next in your career. What, what happens? Well, then after that, uh, we were there for about three months, and then uh, Thomas got an offer to go with uh, Bob Snowden, who was a circus producer who had a show called the International Cavalcade of Stars, and it was a half circus, half magic show, big stage illusions. And they asked me to come over there. Uh, I did a juggling act, a little basic juggling act, and also be stage manager. So I did that, and we spent part of the year in the buildings and part of the year in, in tents, but especially designed circus tented. 
held the stage as well. Hmm. And I did that, and uh, about this time I was getting draft notices. This is 1967, and we had that Vietnam thing going on. And I was sending in my change of address all the time, because I was moving all the time, and, and I was kind of staying one step ahead. And then at the end of the season, I went home, and I'd been home for about a week, and got another notice, and this time it was for a physical. And I went down uh, for the physical, and they stamped all those papers, and they handed them to me. They said, you can be drafted as soon as two weeks. And uh, I oh, I didn't really want to go over to Vietnam. And so I joined the Navy, and ended up going to Vietnam anyway, but that's another deal. Mm -hmm. And spent four years in the Navy at that point. Interrupted my career right when I was going. And so you come back from the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, went back and worked with the circus doing some promotional work. And just before I went into the Navy, I worked for the Commonwealth Edison Company, a public utility in Chicago. And uh, just because I had you know, I had ran out of money and it was winter time. And so and I worked there 90 days. And in those days, if you worked at a company 90 days, when you went into the service, they had to give you a job when you came out. It was a union job and all of your seniority would have to go through. And then you had 120 days after you got out of the service to decide if you wanted to go back there. So I had no intention of going back, but then uh, Tommy Hart and I, who I mentioned earlier, were going to put this show out. I went to work with him. We were doing promotions. And Thomas was getting kind of irascible, and I decided I didn't want to put it, go into business with him. So just the very last possible day, I went back to Edison just to make some money and put out a, a stage show, a magic show, I decided. And there I met my wife, my future wife. And we put together this show and took it on the road then. And, and was your wife in a circus family or? No, she was this person working in an office who hated boring jobs, hated office jobs. She loved being outdoors. She loved travel. She loved adventure. She loved animals. So it was, so I, we did the magic show for a couple of years and I said, let's go back to the circus. And she said, let's do it. And she learned to be an aerialist and she was deathly afraid of heights. I kid you not, if you asked her to step on a chair, she'd be all nervous. Yeah, she ended up doing crazy things at the top of the tent. Hmm. And so uh, where did your career take you next? Well, we were in the circus business here in the United States for, uh, at that time I was ringmastering and we did a, an escape act and a magic act and my wife did aerial acts and worked with elephants, things like that. And uh, we're, we're doing that and in the winter time we would, um, uh, book circuses go out and do what I had done before contracting. And then we were in New Jersey in 1980, I think it was, somewhere around 79, 80, something like that. And an Australian man who worked with the English circuses was visiting and he had a magazine called The King Pole, which is a British circus magazine. And I'd always been an Anglophile. I don't, don't know why. My, my one grandmother was from England, but she died before I was born. I don't know if that's the connection. And he was telling us about traveling. They traveled with, you know, we were doing one-day stands in America seven days a week. And he was talking about traveling with this little British circus that he worked with every year. And he said, oh, we just play week stands. And we take, we have Mondays off. And we go to bed and breakfast in some nice little hotel or something. And we were playing little country towns in England. And it sounded idyllic to us. And he said, you know, you're an American ringmaster, you could probably get a job over there. So, and he had the king pole, which at that was time was the directory issue, which is a once a year issue where they list all the different British circuses and he gave it to me and so I contacted them all and only one expressed an interest but they said they had nothing open and then in 1982 out of the blue they sent me a telegram I was with Carson Barnes Circus out of Hugo and they said uh, we need an American ringmaster for 14 weeks for a summer season can you do it and so I went to D.R. Miller the famous circus impresario and and I told him about it, and uh, he said, oh, wait, no, no, you know, you, you're, you're, this is our second year there, and we loved it at Carson. And I said, no, no, he said, you, you know, you're, you're obligated to us, and well, he's right. And so, I don't know, 15 minutes later, he came by, and he said, you know, it's a chance of a lifetime. I can't hold you back, because I had an assistant on the show. And he said, just go over, come back at the end of it, which was really, really generous of him. So we did. We went to England in 82 for the summer and worked at Clacton Pier. They had the circus in a building at the end of an amusement pier uh, in the North Sea and uh, had an interesting time there. And, and uh, the owner of the circus and I talked frequently and I talked about ideas that we used in the United States to market circuses and they weren't doing them there. And he said, can you come back? And we have a big Christmas show in Birmingham, England every year. Will you come back and work that? And we did and then I came back for that. And then he said, will you, uh, you want me to put together a, 
a, a tour of indoor venues for them and we decided to stay and ended up staying uh, England and Ireland 14 years then. Wow. Point. Wow. And what, what are some of the, the major differences between circuses in America versus the UK? Well, primarily, uh, of course, things have changed here, but at that time, um, most shows were three ring. Uh, Carson and Barnes was five ring show, a big, huge show, uh, whereas the European shows are always one ring. There's once in a great while there'd be a three ring show as a novelty, but primarily they're one ring. Um, they would stay longer in one location, whereas American circuses tend to do one day stands. And they moved at a slower pace to the performance. Mm -hmm. Circuses over in Europe, um, adults appreciate them a lot more than, than uh, here in America. We think of it as children's entertainment, whereas you go to the circus in Germany in the evening and it's primarily adults in the audience. There's a lot more subtle humor with the clowns. Uh, there's more nuance. People can, they're so close too. Mm -hmm. they, they can appreciate it more. And would you serve as ringmaster? Yes. Uh -huh. and, and I went over there and they, uh, I said, you know, I've never really even seen a British ringmaster. And they said, we don't want a British ringmaster, we want an American ringmaster. And it's, it happened to be that uh, the, the musical Barnum had been running in England for a year or so when I got there with Michael Crawford and was hugely popular. And they liked that. And they said, you know, you kind of resemble Michael Crawford a little bit. And so they thought that was a plus. And um, I would sing, which they didn't have singing ringmasters over there hmm. in production of this. So. And, and what were uh, the types of musical pieces you would sing? Oh, like from Barnum. The, our finale oh. was Follow the Flag, and there's a song, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth. Mm -hmm. We used to open with that. Be a Clown was one we did for production numbers. Hmm. And were the shows well received? Yes, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very strong show that in the first year, and second year we were over there. Well, how did you come back to the States? Well, you have time? Sure. Okay. <laughs> We went, we, were, we went the one year uh, with Sally Chipper. This, we went for the summer, then we came back. So Sally Chipper Field Circus. Then we worked 1983 with them. And then at the end of 83, we we're thinking, well, it's about time. Maybe we should just go home. Now we got the chance to see the country. And then Chipper Fields, which was another branch of the family, the bigger circus, was going to Ireland that year. And they asked me to come over as manager and to, to book their tour and manage the show. And so, hey, we've never been to Ireland. This is 1984. So... We did that and uh, went to Ireland and had a great tour there and really loved Ireland. And then we were thinking about going back to the States and then some French people, the Gruss family, which is kind of like the Ringling family of France, a segment of the family was with the Chipperfield Circus, the English Circus in Ireland. And they uh, saw how successful Chipperfields were and I was able to get terrific publicity that year for the show and we hit all the right towns. And they asked me to market a tour and book a tour of the French circus. They were gonna call it Le Grand Cirque de France and bring it over to Ireland. And so we said, well, yes, well, we stayed for that. And uh, the tour was unsuccessful, unfortunately. We were in partnership with them in, in 80. It was a wonderful show, very, very good show, but we, they, they lacked uh, the money to really get it started. In fact, when it came time to bring the show from France, they had no money to ship it. And I had to go and uh, find a shipper, a ferry company would transfer the show over and did a promotional tie in, fortunately, and got it over there. Uh, so at the end of the tour, we were kind of, we we're more or less broke. And um, we thought, well, should we go back to America? And we thought, no, you know, we don't want to go back broke. And so uh, we uh, talked to Philip Gandy, who was a British circus promoter, uh, owner, I should say, and said, we got a lot of ideas. And he said, well, come on over, we'll do a deal. So we set up a company together and um, started promoting the circus with using U.S. marketing techniques. And, uh, and then it was so successful, we, he and I uh, set up a separate circus called Circus Star, which is still running today, that we got up and running and, and ran for a number of years. And then we decided to come back here to the States at the end of 95, actually early 96. And now that you're back in, in the States, where are you looking to settle? Or are you still looking to, to work or retire or? Well, it's, um, life is full of surprises, especially in the circus business. And we had, uh, in 2002, at the end of 2002, I was contacted by the Big Apple Circus, which is a uh, 
one of the best circuses in the United States. It's a actually a 501c not-for-profit company based in New York City. It's the La Creme de la Creme of circuses, and they, um, for example, play Lincoln Center right next to the Metropolitan Opera House, literally next door to the Metropolitan Opera House for three months every year in the fall and, and winter. Um, it's a very prestigious, and they offered me a job as a production unit manager, which is like the circus manager. And we spent uh, almost four years there and absolutely loved it and thought we would retire there. It was, uh, you moved 11 times a year instead of 200 and some times. Sat in New York City for three months of the year and then in Boston for seven weeks. It was wonderful. And then, I have to backtrack a bit here. Do we have time for sure, this? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Back in, in 1984, I was booking Chipperfield Circus in a town called Nace in Ireland at a race track, a race course as they call it. And I was doing the deal with the man, the manager, and he said, you know, the only circus people I know are the Norths. My ears shot up there. And I said, you know the Norths? Well, Henry North's book, what got me really interested in the circus. And he said, yeah. He said, they've got a place in, in Galway. I said, I know, it's somewhere in Ireland, because they had, uh, in the, I guess, the early 60s, bought back the old family estate, the North family. And I just knew it was somewhere in Galway, County Galway. And he said, well, it's in a, outside of a little town called Bella, uh, it's near Bellinasloe, near a town, a little town called Ockrim. And uh, I said, oh, wow, that was it. I finally had my lead. This is before the internet, of course, and now you can find anything. So the next year with the French show, I was coming through, going on my way to book Galway, Beverly, my wife and I, and we made a side trip to Ockram and um, stopped in the local pub and asked for directions. They gave me directions and I drove out. There was Northbrook Cattle Company. And I went to the office and I, there's a man there sweeping. And I said, is Mr. Henry North here? And he said, well, he's not here, but I'm his son, John. And it was John Ringler North II. And uh, I said, well, I'm Jim Royal with the circus. Oh, with the circus. And then he's come out over to the house. And so uh, he, his father and uncle owned Ringling Brothers from like 38 more or less right through till they sold it in 1967. And he had always thought he was going to be taking over the circus. But his uncle, who is a 51% owner, decided to sell. And so they sent him over here to set up this cattle operation at, at the old family estate. But he always loved the circus. So he and I stayed friends. And when we were in England, we'd come over and stay with him in Ireland. And, and he'd visit us when we came back to the States. And um, again, one of those strange coincidences, we were with Big Apple Circus in 2006, this would have been. And we, had, we were in Washington. And we had, uh, John was coming over to the States. He lived in Ireland. And he wanted to get together. And he said, let's go to 21 in New York. I'll, I'll buy dinner. And so we were, we had the date set and about a day or two before then, um, I was talking to one of the people in Big Apple and they said, did you hear that Kelly Miller's not going out next year? They're, they're, they're not going to take it out. They're going to sell the show. And I said, wow, and we couldn't we were, believe it because it's a great show. It had a wonderful reputation. It was such, so well run, high quality show. So I don't know, two days later, we're, we're with John at 21 and talking and he always talks circus. And he said, well, what's happening? He said, well, we just found out Kelly Miller's not going on the road, and we talked about that. That was we had a wonderful evening, and then uh, he went back to Ireland, and I get a call two, three days later. He said, do you know who owns Kelly Miller? I said, yeah, David Rawls is the president of the circus. And he said, if I buy it, will you run it for me? And I said, well, I thought, yeah, I need a challenge. It's, so we, he, I called him up, we did the arrangements, and he bought the show, and a couple weeks later, here I am in Hugo. And so what year is this? This would be uh, tail end of 2006. We took over in January 2007. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had thought I'd be retiring with Big Apple, and uh, here we are today with Kelly Miller. Well, backing up just a little bit, um, what was your, your first exposure to Hugo? Around what year with Carson and Barnes? That would have been, uh, we came from Florida and drove up here in February of 81. And uh, my first impression of Hugo wasn't ter terrible. We knew it was a great circus city, but we arrived in a horribly cold, dreary, rainy, and by the time we got here, it was dark, and it was, you know, raining and dreary, and we came out, we parked, and we got stuck in mud, we were pulling a trailer, and, but then we went in and met DR, and he, he was such a great character that, you know, the next day the sun was out, it was a beautiful day, everything. 
everything was fine. And and what were your impressions of D.R. Miller? Oh, we loved him right off the bat. I mean, he, he had such a reputation because he was such a remarkable, remarkable man. I mean, he was just 100% circus in there. But he was, he, has, he was great fun, too. And, and I think people in the circus uh, liked him and respected him because he had done everything. And they had started with absolutely nothing and built up this huge, huge circus. And he'd had so many ups and downs over the years. And we all liked him and respected him. He, he always seemed to me he always had that good sense of humor no matter how difficult things were well now you're at the helm of, of kelly miller uh did you make any any changes what were your plans your goals uh in taking out the show for the, the new season well we tried we're trying we, uh, mr north of course his background is ringling brothers and farnham and bailey um he always loved the tented circus they went indoors in 1957 and that kind of lost some of its luster for him so he loves show and I do too uh, but but he was accustomed to this huge production of you know 1500 people literally and so he's always trying to, to increase things and I'm always saying watch the budget why don't we pay the bills here so he's he really concentrates on improving the performance which is a good thing uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, the types of, of acts now uh, that are on the show uh, that you try to incorporate well we have uh, we do some production numbers in the show, which Mr. North likes. We have uh, three elephants joined the show. We've added uh, wild animals, which haven't, they haven't had for a number of years here. We've got uh, an act with five tigers in it. And we also have a camel act. It has choreography with dancing girls as well in that. And uh, we have uh, what's called a Risley act, a very good Risley act. A Risley act is a very unusual act. You don't see them often in the circus. It's juggling human beings with your feet. That's what essentially it is. A man, in this case, the father of the family, leans back on a, in a cushioned kind of table thing and propels his children with, with his feet. And they do somersaults, double somersaults, twists, turns, flips. It's very unusual. And aerial acts, of course. We have a young lady from Australia who's with us who does a very extreme sort of aerial act. It's one of those nail biters keeps you on the edge of your seat. Well, if, if, uh, how do you go about uh, choosing the acts every season? In the glorious days when John's father and his uncle were running Ringling Brothers, they would, John's uncle would go to Europe every year and travel around all over Europe, going to nightclubs, the circuses, all sorts of things. He, one time, one of the most famous Ringling aerialists, Benita Del Oro, he found a little gypsy circus, little open air traveling circus. But he would go around scouting acts that way, which was a good way to do it. He had some wonderful meals and cocktails. But nowadays it's all you get, uh, people send you, here's a link on YouTube, you can see my act, and DVDs and that sort of thing. So they, and um, we built up a reputation of having a quality show, which it always was. Kelly Moore always was a first class show. Uh, and a show where we have a, a very long season, good regular, long lengthy period of pay. And uh, we think we, we value people on the show, so they have people have a feeling of, of being appreciated. And so we have people knocking on the door to work here. Mm -hmm. And during the season, uh, as you're managing everything, could you take me through a, a typical day for you? Well, in recent years, there, there's so much to do with the what we call the front end of the circus, which is what we are right here, big chunk of it here in this office in Hugo. Um, we so much takes place before the circus hits the road and I, I, last year or two I've spent more and more time here than on the road and to, to the point that Oscar Perez is our day-to-day -day manager on the circus so right now and certainly this year uh, I, I got the circus on the road and spent the first month with it make sure everything was all set for me and then I came in here and it's just you know 10 hour 11 hour days here all day long the trouble with this, people say the circus is dying, but we've been hearing that for generations. Um, we're having exceptionally good business year after year. Um, the biggest challenge we face is the cost involved with the circus, and now it's just so complicated. We spend hours and hours here in this office dealing with regulations of all types. I mean, your average business is inspected by local authorities maybe once a year. Whereas we're inspected every single day of the week by different authorities and we have to comply with different laws, different regulations, different forms, and just endless paperwork. Mm -hmm. 
How do you go about choosing your route? Do you uh, get together with the other circuses in town or uh, y'all divvy up the area or? Well, it's kind of circuses more, some of them have their more or less an established route. Um, and we do, we cover an area from, we've added Rio Grande Valley, which we didn't used to do. We've done that, this is our third year. Uh, and it's given us an additional five or six weeks of work because we open up down there where it's warm. It's an 800 mile drive down there, but, but it works well for us. We start there and then we work kind of in a northeasterly direction out as far as uh, this year we're going into New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Then we swing west to Chicago land area and then back down to Hugo and that's over a 38 week period. So that's, that's kind of the established Kelly Miller route, that area. And it varies a little bit one way or the other, but we know certain areas we're going to be at certain times and then we, we book the route accordingly. We have a lot of towns that we play every year, some towns every other year. And, and do you have a, a personal favorite? Of the towns? Mm -hmm. uh, no, not particularly. There's so many that have certain things that you like about them. There may be a little restaurant or something. That's uh, one of the things about the circus when you've been doing it for many, many years and going to all these towns. I'll find myself driving and without thinking, go, you know, going somewhere. And suddenly I'll be in a town, I'll think, wait a minute. About three blocks up ahead, if you turn right, there's a really good restaurant right down there, a little home cooking kind of place, and you get there and sure enough, that's it. And yet I don't know where I put my glasses. <laughs> how big of a, a lot, or, or how small of a lot can you perform on? We, we shoot for 300 feet by 300 feet. Um, that's our ideal footprint, mm -hmm. but we can fit in smaller areas. We do need about 180 by 180 minimum for the tent portion of it. Then we can kind of juggle things around. Um, we have some terrifically talented people on the circus. Uh, Gustavo Perez, for example, our superintendent, of getting that circus shoehorned into different locations and how you get all the vehicles in. Um, so we, we sometimes we're in an L shape, sometimes it's you know, irregular shapes. And, and how many uh, trucks contain everything? We move on, on circus owned vehicles. There are um, 17 mm -hmm. this year. And then we have all together about 33 that are traveling with the circus. And that's people's uh, employees, RVs, acts that have their motor homes or travel trailers that they live in. And have you noticed um, as we go through the years, government regulations becoming tighter and tighter or, or obtaining visas a problem? Yes. Uh -huh. One of the, our big hurdles is in, in, since, oh, I guess maybe like 25 years or so now, um, circuses have taken advantage of seasonal H-2B visas, which allow people to come into the country for a nine, I think it's macro, 10 months. And trying to find someone who wants to work seven days a week, virtually nonstop for 38 weeks in all kinds of weather, no matter how cold it is out there, how wet, how muddy, but to put that show up, you can't get, it's hard to find people that are willing to do that. Um, and then a number of years back, circuses came across the H2B visa worker, which brings up seasonal workers. And we have, our workers come from Mexico, from the Puebla area. They've been coming to us for years and years and years. They're not illegal immigrants. They're not immigrants at all. They're workers on a visa, a temporary visa. And they come up and uh, they want to go home. They just want to come up and work them home. And what do we get then? We get reliable help that works very hard no matter what the conditions. Uh, they're, they're friends to us. We've known them all for many years. And uh, they come home. They go, I mean, we pay taxes. We pay Social Security, which benefits you and I because they never use that Social Security contribution. And they go at the end of the show's over. They're heading home. Um, and we have to pay the highest minimum wage of any location we go to in the United States. So of the 18 states we go to and the, all the communities, we have to find which one pays the highest minimum wage. And that's what our minimum wage can be for a worker, these h 2 workers, but a lot of them make a lot more money than that. Mm -hmm. So it's not like taking jobs away from Americans. Right. And it's, uh, and the government has caused, made it difficult sometimes. And then when the economy was great, People like landscapers and so forth were using them. And so the, there's a limited number, 66,000 per year. And the numbers will be taken up and we have trouble getting workers. Um, and now the Department of Labor this year has is, is decided they don't think it's a good program. So they're doing everything they can to make it unworkable. 
which is a sad commentary because when we, in order to get these workers, we have to advertise for Americans, which is fine. It'd be a lot cheaper for us than not have to go through all of this, which costs thousands of dollars. We advertise, and this year we got two responses, which is typical. We hired one man, mm -hmm. and he's still with us. Uh, the previous year we had three responses, and um, one of them came for an interview. The other two never showed. The one that came for an interview was going to come back to work the next week, never showed. It's just mm -hmm. a sad situation. And uh, approximately how many HTB visas uh, do you obtain every year? We do about 23, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now when a circus comes to town, how do you find the sponsors? We have uh, people like I, what I did when I was a, a young, obnoxious teenager called the contracting agent. Ideally, it, is um, we have someone out in the field. And we have, as I mentioned, a lot of towns that are every year towns, and a lot of towns that are every other year towns. But we're always trying to look for a new town because you'll be with a group. Um, sometimes you're with a, I don't know, Alliance Club, for example, and then over the years they kind of disintegrate and the club's not as strong as it used to be. So you want a new new town. So these people go out and we will, we're going from A to B and in between there, we want to play a town, and we'll, we'll look at towns and see which one the demographics look good on, and the contracting agent will go into that community, look for a place to find the circuit where they can put the circus on, and then start knocking on doors and calling and talking to chambers of commerce, rotary clubs, lions, education foundations, see who wants to do it as a fundraiser. And usually, uh, you know, do you ever find that Circuses are confused with carnivals. Oh, people oftentimes, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and we're circus people, we're a little huffy about that, aren't we? And, and, we, and why is that? I think it's because, and this is no disrespect because there's so many great carnival people, uh, but but we feel that the, the circus is, is it, and in other, certainly in other countries, it's respected as one of the arts. It's considered part of culture. Um, in France, they get letters of honor from the government for the circus performers, and they're awarded things. Uh, and it's in Monte Carlo, for example, uh, uh, Princess Stephanie is the patron of the circus, and they have the Monte Carlo Festival about the circus every year. But here, we're just the circus, you know, and uh, they don't, I, people don't give it the respect they feel it deserves. And then we think, well, a lot of carnivals have people that are just operating a ride. They're kind of, in some cases, not. Maybe a little bit shiftless. Mm -hmm. Not in all cases, just one or two. Mm -hmm. But they do, doesn't require tremendous skill. Whereas we have people, we have people with Kelly Miller that are like eight and nine generations of circus that perform a certain act that they've owned for those many, many generations. But because we're a traveling organization, we're lumped together. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the, the essential jobs on the road? Uh, you know, we hear, you know, front lot, back lot. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of those essential jobs when it comes to, to putting on the show? We, well, with the circus, um, the f contracting agent is the person who books the circus, gets the, the contract signed with the Rotary Club or whoever, maybe that's early on. Then we have the home office, and here we have a team of people that more or less uh, hold the hand of the sponsor and guide them through the process and help them all the way along in promoting the circus together. It's a joint effort. And then um, two weeks out or three weeks out, we have uh, Carly and Charlie, our husband and wife clown team. They go in and promote the circus. They meet with the sponsor and go to schools and old age homes, things like that, entertaining and promoting. And then 12 days out, the bill posters arrive. And uh, the bill posters put up the posters in the community telling about the circus coming. And then the 24-hour man arrives the day before, the 24-hour man or the arrow man. And he's the man that with shows like ours that are primarily one-day stands. Today, for example, he would go in the office around 9 in the morning when they open and talk and get the route to the next town and get the details. Then he leaves and he puts little paper arrows. Each circus or carnival has their own distinctive style of arrows. And he puts these on poles indicating where to turn. He guides the circus from today's town to the next town. 
and he goes ahead to make sure that the route plan is a good one and there's not suddenly a low overpass or something that they weren't aware of. Gets to the next town, meets with the sponsor, and puts little markers in where everything's going to go on the lot. He marks where the tent will be, where the elephants are going, where the cookhouse is going, and so forth. And so then, the next morning, the earliest one in this case is Gustavo Perez with Kelly Miller, who's the superintendent. He's the first one there, and he gets there and looks over and talks to the arrow man. And uh, he may make some adjustments because he's really the, the pro at this. He might say, no, let's move the tent back a little bit. It looks kind of soft there. It's supposed to have been going to rain and we want to get the, the show as close to the edge as possible. And uh, then, then he and the arrow man spot everybody. And then the process of setting up begins for that day. And the cookhouse goes to work. They set up the cookhouse early and they start preparing the first meal of the day. Men unload the tents, the animals are unloaded and cared for. Tent goes up, seats go in, frigging lights. People practice during the day. When school starts, we have a school for the for the children with the circus. Hmm. A couple of shows, tear it all down, go to sleep, get up, do it again. And you're on to the next town. Yeah. We have a this year a four day stand. That's the longest stand of the season. Otherwise, it's mostly one day. And how many miles uh, approximately do you travel every day? It averages out to be about 40 miles. We'll do 10,000 miles over 38 weeks. And in, in your eyes, what are you know the, the must-haves? When you think circus, do you think, I must have elephants, I must have X? What are your must-haves? Well, Although you can do a great circus in a building, I think a tent circus is really what, where the circus is at its best. And elephants, of course, I would have to have right up there too. And, and you know, we poll our audiences and, and survey them to see what they like best. And nine times out of ten, number one is always elephants. And so you have to, but a good circus really has to have certain ingredients. It's got to have good comedy in it. It has to have a, a nice mixture of animals. It has to have aerial acts, it has to have acrobatic acts, ground acts, and, and it has to have a good fast pace to it. Those are the prerequisites, I would say. We have, you know, we're inundated with uh, media and smartphones and uh, everything today is, has really changed from days gone by. Uh, do you think the circus will continue to, to remain popular in our culture? Do you see it dwindling? No, I, I, as mentioned earlier, our obstacle, our cost in trying to, because moving the circuits around the country, as you can imagine, is really expensive. And uh, we can't raise the prices so high that families can't afford to go. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was uh, young and researching the circus, uh, reading the, in 1938, Ringling Brothers had a, a strike by the working personnel and they, they were, you know, they shut down for a short time. And I think it was the New Republic magazine had a headline, the circus is dead. This is it, you know, we're never gonna see circuses anymore. Little did they know. And the same thing when Ringling Brothers uh, stopped touring under canvas and went into the arenas. So I think the circus is always gonna be around, but the circus arts have certainly been with us way, way, way back. Um, and it's, if we get people out and you have a good quality circus and a, a well presented circus like Kelly, you entertain people, you're, you're sure to. And the nice thing about the circus is you go inside and you see, not it's not uncommon to see a grandparent, a parent, and a child, three generations sitting together and they're looking at the circus and they have that same expression at all three ages, which is wonderful to watch, whether it's they're laughing at the clowns or they're kind of nervous watching the tight wire performer. Because the circus is successful because it hits all those ages. It, it entertains people of all ages. And so I think that it will always be around. Our, and it's, our problem is, is the competition and getting people out there. It's expensive. Well, well who, who is your competition? Everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. the text messages, people in you know, you know, electronic devices, uh, the, the internet. People can sit in front of computers now for hours and hours and hours. But when they get out there and sit in the tent, it's, it is a magical time. And of course, the various uh, network television, cable television, DVDs, movies, mm -hmm. 
all the electronic media, books that are electronic now. What is it? Well, you, you mentioned a lot about the, the role of, of uh, the staff on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what comes up, what goes on in the home office, what type of, of staff members you have. You mentioned that uh, they help guide the sponsors through the process. Do you have uh, marketing people in house here, or what are the the types of positions? We have um, a team of several people here. Me, I just kind of get everyone's way, everyone's hair, and um, we have people out in the field that are doing the booking, and then uh, Jill Jones, who's our office manager here. She and I sit down, um, not too far from right now, and start planning the following year's tour, and we get the we know more or less what areas we're going to, and then we kind of single out what town we're going to. And then we have to contact the sponsors that we expect to be on board to make sure that they're on board for the tour and lay out all the, lay out all the tour. And then it's a process of contacting them and getting all of that lined up. We have another lady here, Katie Maxwell, and she deals with the sponsors uh, regarding um, logistics and things like that with them. And, and she goes through different processes with them. We have another position which we're just getting a new person in that Jill is replacing right now that does the advertising and marketing and promotion of the events working with the sponsors. And then we have a Brenda Rawls who does the business side of it, the accounting side, payroll, things like that. And then we have a telephone marketing company that we're associated with and they, they work with the sponsors as well. Do you do automated calls in the community or? No, just uh, the businesses. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so what's the most important job on the road that you, that you see in your eyes? Who, who's, whose job is really integral to the whole process? Well, if you're doing the circus right, everyone. You know, the, it's it's every single job is really important. And the circus is, there's very little waste ever in a circus. Um, you don't find jobs where there's what used to be called feather bedding. I don't know if they use that term anymore. That's an old union term, I guess. Um, people are, they're not fluff jobs. They're all, they have meat and potatoes. What horrible metaphors I'm using. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're, they're essential jobs. And on, on the circus, the man who is shoveling up after the elephants is very is is really important. And the, the thing that people always say in the circus is, um, once in a while, people get that attitude. You know, I'm I'm not going to be out of here, and you guys are going to be lost without me. Well, it always goes on. The circus always, <laughs> no matter who leaves, you know, it carries on. What is your 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 favorite part? You're sitting back. You've had a long career. Uh, you know, you're you're now running Kelly Miller. What what is your favorite part about the circus? It's the thing that's gonna sound. Uh, it'll sound like a Frank, Frank Capra movie. It'll sound so corny and so hokey. It's to go into that tent and and just and look around at the audience and or, or you hear the laughs when the clowns are in and you stick your head in and look and you see the expressions on the people's faces and you see families together having a great time and knowing that the magic hits them. Do you have some just really standout circus moments as you look back? Just you get together with your wife or, or you know your circus family that you like to tell just in your mind that you go back to all the time? Well, there's uh, I suppose funny moments that we think about and, and neat experiences. I remember when I first, the first time we were in England and that first opening, that first show and uh, during the, the finale for production, I was there and I was thinking, we're in England. This is, hey, we're here. We made it in England. We're with an English circus. And that is really, really something. Um, I think opening uh, at Lincoln Center with Big Apple was uh, something we always remember that first time we did that. Well, tell me a little bit about the Hugo community. You know, you're, the circus is a big part of the community. Uh, are they friendly to the needs of, of showmen? They are indeed. Um, we were with, the, as I mentioned, the Hugo, the uh, Carson Brown's 81, 82, and then we were over in Europe all that time. Then we came back to work for DR when he put out a, a 
show called the Chinese Imperial Circus, which was a, he had a complete Chinese circus he brought over from China, obviously, and we toured America and Canada with him. And uh, I remember coming back at the end of that season, and you drive down, down Jackson and Hugo, and that was back in the days when they would have the reader board signs, businesses used to have them, and they would say, welcome home circus, and all the different businesses, and I thought, wow, that's really great. And, and that's just the way it is in, here in Cuba. The circus is so much a part of it. And even not all that long ago, I, I, last fall, I guess it was, I was in the post office and someone, I have no idea who it was, who knew me, and said, how was the season? And I said, well, we had a good season. Here. Okay. And, and people ask you that, and it's, um, they kind of know about this, understand the circus more than other businesses here. I mean, other than businesses in a regular community, a non-circus community. And we're very much a part of it here, mm -hmm. and and accepted. It's, we're just like as if we ran a lumberyard or something, which is great. And you, and you get support. You can go into a bank and, and talk about circus things, and they know what you're talking about. I remember the first first year we took over Kelly Miller, one of the bank presidents, uh, was a member of the Rotary Club, which was the sponsor of the circus every year. And he saw me a few days before we opened, and he said, you know, if you need anything, and we opened on the Saturday, he said, if you need anything, let me know. We'll come and open the bank for you. If you need to get change or anything, let me know. That's the kind of attitude here. Well, what is, uh, why keep winter quarters in, in Hugo? What's, is it just because of the longstanding history? Is there anything that, that you find unique about the location? Well, there's a there's an advantage to being here. A lot of shows winter in Florida, which of course has a better winter than, than we do. But surprisingly, Hugo winters are uh, relatively mild. Uh, the animals can go out most of the time. We have you know acres and acres of land for the animals to go out on. And so often people will call me and they'll say, "Oh, you're in Oklahoma. Boy, you had a horrible storm there the other day." Well, they did in Oklahoma City and, and north, but where we are in this little southeastern corner, for some reasons, we don't get the horrible weather so often. So winters aren't absolutely dreadful here. They're fairly mild. And uh, Florida, of course, is great. But in Florida, you really you can only go north. That's about all you can really do there. Whereas here, we could go west. We could get into West Texas, Arizona, head out to California that way. We could go north through the Plain States. We could go the way Kelly Miller used to do and head off into uh, Arkansas and up north that way. Or you can go south. Go to Louisiana. You've got many different directions to go to to start your tour. So we have that advantage. So geographically, it's in a good location. The climate is, is mild. A little warm in the summertime. The circus isn't here. Very warm in the summertime. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, well, where do you do you see the, the circus business going, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years? You see any major changes? There's the um, Cirque du Soleil, of course, has come on the scene, and it's a hybrid of the circus. Um, I think it, eventually it's going to just kind of stabilize, and it's an expansion period right now, but it'll shrink somewhat. Um, the number of tented shows like ours has, has diminished over the years, and, uh, and that's really, as I've mentioned before, primarily the cost is the, is the big challenge we face. And I think that they, we're probably about the point that it's not going to get in the fewer than there are right now. And they'll continue to be the building surfaces. So I think it more or less will be about as it is now to see great changes. But then one never knows mm -hmm. what will happen. I mean, we didn't know about, uh, like in John North, who's our owner, uh, spends part of his year in Ireland, and he texts me messages throughout the day. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, I would have never thought I could sit here and go like this and be in Ireland in a second. So there could be some surprises there that will affect us. Any major, uh, not that I want to tip off your, your competition, any major uh, plans you're hoping to integrate into future Kelly Miller shows? Uh, no, uh, we've kind of settled on the format of a very traditional circus and all the ingredients of, of old fashioned circus. And we find it's very successful. Uh, we're getting nothing but good reviews from our sponsors and our audiences, and it, we're doing it the way we think it used to be and the way it should be done, and it's it's working very well. And I think if we keep to that uh, format, we're in good shape. 
of course, always trying to get new surprises in it, new acts, new features, freshening it up. Well, I appreciate your time today. Before we close, is there anything else you'd like to mention that I haven't asked you about? I think we've, we've run the gauntlet, haven't we? Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I want to focus a little bit on uh, the museum that's uh, coming to town and, and kind of the origins and uh, how it kind of evolved, the, the background of, of the history of it. The um, library here in Hugo was in a, in a building that leaked and it was not in a great state of repair and uh, local people felt on the library board that they needed a new library and they got together and worked really hard and held fundraisers and did everything possible. And I remember seeing a sign, future home of the library on a vacant lot. And then I was gone and came back from New York four years later, and there was this beautiful new library. And it's a gorgeous library. And inside, there's a huge circus section there. They concentrate on the circus. It has a circus motif in it. There's big bronze sculptures of the circus inside. And the librarian, Alina Swink, and Marilyn Custer, who was on the library board, were looking at the beautiful window in the great big window of the library across the street at a house in a, in a vacant lot and thinking, boy, we don't want to see like a fast food restaurant going in there. We need to put something there. And they thought about having a, uh, an arts facility there of some sort. And then that idea didn't work too well. And uh, then they thought, wait a minute, a circus museum. That's a circus museum and park there. Small park and a museum, small museum. And so they began working on it and uh, became a 5013C. They invited each of the circuses to participate. And uh, so I'm the board member for Kelly Miller. And we've been working ever since. We got a mortgage and bought the property and we are in the process of it. We were going to convert the houses on the property into a museum. But in talking to funders, they said that we'd be, we would be better off dismantling the house it would be easier to get funding for a brand new facility that was purpose built than try to convert an old structure. But fortunately, we're uh, taking bits and pieces of the house and, and selling it, and all the old interior doors and woodwork and so forth. So we're recycling it, which is a good thing. And uh, we're doing various fundraisers to raise money to build the museum, and it'll salute uh, Hugo Circus history. And we plan to have a very much an educational facility. There'll be one. It's going to be a series of buildings, four pods connecting, and one of them is an educational building where we'll be giving lectures on the circus and different aspects of the circus and teaching circus skills to youth. That's one of the things we're starting on right now. This fall, we'll be working with Hugo Schools, the museum, as a project teaching circus skills, basic skills to the youngsters, and it gives them a chance to develop physically and uh, challenge them mentally and get self-esteem and learn teamwork, things like that. Does the house have any uh, historical circus significance? Well, not really. It was owned for some time by David Rawls, but then it was circus for many years of the President Kelly Miller circus, but that's it. Okay. It just happened to be there in the right location. And I guess now it's still in the fundraising process. Mm -hmm. Right now we have two major fundraisers. We have a circus festival the first Saturday in November. Uh, on the museum grounds where we have uh, free circus acts that the circus people donate their time and talent and uh, various games and so forth and fun activities and chances for people to spend money and donate. And then we started last January for the first time, uh, we open a cafe once a year. It's called the International Red Nose Cafe. And it was a great success last year. And what we do is we have uh, recipes from circus performers. In the circus business, it's always very international. When we have an, an evening off or something frequently, we'll have potluck dinners together. And the person from France brings a recipe that they or their family has. The people from Peru bring a specialty from Peru. So you get all these wonderful international dishes that you can taste and, and, and learn about the culture. Well, we decided we'll have a meal like that. So we have a huge buffet. And last year we did capacity business. Uh, and people came to, to try all these different circus recipes. And, and we had circus acts performing as well. So that's the other major fundraiser. And a cookbook is coming out with those recipes shortly. Wonderful. And we're seeking funding through different organizations. And uh, is there a estimated completion date? No, unfortunately not. Uh, just when things were getting going good, that's when the old economy hit the, hit the skids. And uh, mm -hmm. it's been very difficult fundraising major contributions. 
Well, it seems like a, a a good project to undertake, especially in Hugo with the history and uh, the continuing winter quarters of, of several organizations. Mm -hmm. History uh, in Hugo is an area that's uh, economically deprived and in this part of the state, and uh, they're trying to get the bolster tourism here because there's a wonderful Hugo Lake and outdoor facilities, and people are aware of Hugo as a circus town, and so they come to the town to see a little bit of the circus. And of course, we have the Showman's Rest Cemetery, which is a, we're a part of Mount Olivet Cemetery, and interesting gravestones of the circus people. But it needs that museum, it needs that piece in there. Mm -hmm. So people can come at any time of year and experience part of the circus. And that's what the museum will provide. Well, one more, more question. Uh, not that I'm trying to, to put you into retirement. Um, I've got my lottery ticket. <laughs> uh, you know, as you look towards the future and where you want to retire, you, you of course have traveled all over the world, all over the country. Uh, any parts of the world you have your eye on for retirement? Well, uh, finances, of course, enter into that always. Um, we bought a home in Iowa. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, but my grandparents were in a little town. He was a coal miner in southern Iowa. And uh, my wife and I used to visit there, and we liked the area, and bought a house there, thinking we'd retire there. But now we spend so much time in Hugo, we recently bought a, a mobile home here in Hugo. So maybe we'll be part of the year, part of the year there, here, back and forth. I don't know. Do you miss going out on the road much? Uh, yes and no. Um, nowadays, everything, business is conducted electronically so much, and when you're on the road, you're sometimes you're in mountains, you don't get good internet reception, you can't send emails, you can't scan items and send them. So um, I find I can get so much more done sitting in an office than every day, you know, moving. And, and with, with your office on the road, you have to kind of put things down because you're traveling. It sucks up a lot of valuable time. Well, but I do miss uh, traveling. You miss, you miss yeah. it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, to ask, you know, I know early on you, you had your sights set on circus, but uh, if you could do it all over again, if you could be anything you wanted to be, what, what would you be? Uh, uh, the son of extremely wealthy parents uh, and a lazy, you know, <laughs> I think it, it, the circus has given me so much satisfaction. I can't think of anything else that I would, it's something that, that uh, like I said earlier, you're really lucky if you find something that you love and you make a living at. And, uh, and it can, it's taken me all over the world almost. And, and it's something that can really stir you inside. It, it hits you that way when you're in. Like Cecil B. DeMille said, you can shake the sawdust out of your shoes, but you can't shake it out of your heart. And I can't imagine anything else that would do that. I'm sure there's possibly something, but I don't know what it is. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. How would you uh, close a show as a roadmaster? I used to say, um, what was it that I used to say? Until we meet again, keep the circus magic in your heart. Well, I think that's a good way to end. Did you did you change it up through the years? or? Yes, uh -huh, that was, uh, I was trying to think of something and I came up with that. Well, thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure.